All right, so help. My code base has five JSON libraries. Um, this is the story of how generics and metaprogramming came to my rescue. So the focus of my talk is really going to be uh, implementing traits with functions. Um, so some of the things we're going to go over, uh, detecting if a function or a method is implemented for a type, uh, checking if a ADL implementation exists. It also works for overloaded functions. And then we're going to sprinkle in some compile time requirements and uh, Cinefy. So substitution failure is not an error. If you are looking for an introduction to this topic, uh, probably not the best talk for you. Uh, but I do have some recommendations. Uh, Back to Basics Tracks has a templates by Bob Siegel from two years ago. Uh, and there's also Type Traits by Jody Higgins, which is a two-part series, and it's absolutely excellent. And I'm going to be referring to it a little bit. So um, you will not need to know JSON or Web Tokens. Uh, it's just going to be the narrative arc for this talk. So the first question I almost always get when people find out about this is like, were you really using five JSON libraries? Um, and yes, so I made this cute little timeline for you guys to share. Um, and like any new project, we started off with some new technologies. And it was a RESTful API JSON library. Uh, and we picked rapid JSON at the beginning. It was performance low level enough that it could work with our IoT. And it was pretty good. Um, but you can't say IoT without involving security. And very quickly, we needed to add OpenSSL TLS requirements. But you can't just add OpenSSL to your requirements. You also need to be able to update it for security vulnerabilities. And once you need to manage your dependencies and update them, you start scratching your head as a C++ developer. Um, and we went through a couple different package managers. But the only one that really met our company requirements, our business requirements, was Conan. Uh, so as I stand up here with my Conan t-shirt, um, I'm going to give you the warning. With great power comes great responsibility. Um, so do as I say and not as I do. And this talk is a great example of that. So um, obviously, now that we had access to all this high quality open source libraries, we're like, oh, we'll just rewrite our tech stack, right? Um, and one of the big libraries we picked was uh, Microsoft CPP REST SDK. And it has its own JSON implementation to do RESTful API work. And it was super convenient. Um, but projects grow, things happen, right? And uh, customers asked for a settings API. We said, oh, we'll go grab Boost file system and we'll go grab a modern JSON for C++. And uh, look at that, we got our settings API knocked out. And of course, security comes back around and product managers say, oh, we need to add authorization, OAuth 2, here's some new security specifications you need to implement. And we picked JWT CPP. Um, and that was based on Pico JSON. So, you can see those are the four libraries that we started using, right? We got Rapid JSON, CPP REST SDK, uh, Niels Lohm's uh, Modern JSON CPP, and Pico JSON. But of course, we're using Conan, so we update our dependencies. And what came out in Boost 175, 176? Boost JSON. Uh, so the only thing worse than using five JSON libraries is not knowing if you're using five JSON libraries. Um, so we myself and a few others in the industry all had pretty similar technology that we picked. Uh, these technology frameworks in C++ for doing authorization are pretty limited. Um, and this became a problem, right? So uh, the code was really convoluted, and it really began to get a lot of duplication. So our client and server side were implemented in different uh, languages and servers. So we had different strings that we had to work with between narrow and wide conversions. And it was just an absolute mess to rewrite our algorithms. So I was at an industry workshop, and uh, I was at lunch griping with some of my colleagues. And one of them said, why don't you template out the logic and metaprogram a traits implementation? Well, geez, thanks, Gareth. Uh, and that's what I spent about three months of my life doing. Uh, it was totally worth it, though. So what does the solution look like? Um, this is it. So this is a templated class, basic claim. And it takes adjacent traits. And you can notice there's two static asserts. Um, is valid traits. And there's a second one is, is valid JSON types. So this code is from a project called JWT CPP. And I've been contributing to this project quite a bit. Uh, we just hit uh, 475 stars on GitHub. Yay, go drop it a star if you don't mind. Uh, and this is where I got to experiment, play with it. And this code is actually quite widely used. Um, I also work on Conan Center as a contributor. And I found out that we had like top 100 downloads for the month of August. That's pretty good. So if we look at these two things, there's a bunch of type accessing. And what the hell do these do, right? 
but you need to know a little bit about a web token first. So um, JWT stands for JSON Web Token. Uh, that's Java, uh, JavaScript Object Notation. Um, and there are a bunch of predefined keys. So you can see in the example here, we got an algorithm, a type, uh, and then we have a payload section, and that's a uh, sub name IAT and audience. Right, so the structure and format of this is really well standardized, and there's a lot of predefined things, which makes it really good for um, template and type trading because the algorithms are generic regardless of the implementation of the container. At least ideally that would be true. So there's two real user stories that come out when you look at implementing JSON web tokens. Uh, there's creating and there's verifying JSON web tokens. So to create one, uh, you have to build the JSON objects and again, predefined types. So we only work with strings, integers, and arrays. Um, and to verify, you have to split the string, uh, iterate over the keys, and validate the specific ones. Right, so our traits needs a set of functions to do the conversions and some types that it needs to know how to work with. All right, so if we look at a specific claim, in this case our audience, uh, there can either be a string or an array of strings. That's what the spec defines, so it's pretty easy. And you can see in this example we have uh, an array which is my app and it's gonna be user zero. So if we wanted to actually verify that claim, what would that look like? So you can here see in the snippet, um, we have if claim type is string, and we have another one which is uh, get type and array, right? So there's, right here, we have these functions we need to implement, and our traits need to define what these are so we know how to work with that specific JSON library. All right, so uh, here's some pseudocode for what your JSON library implementation might look like, and we have some example traits. Right, and we have this uh, static array as array const value ref. Right, this is just the API that we used. So we take some generic value, right? It's JavaScript, so there's doc typing, so it's not a specific type. There's a generic container usually for most JSON libraries. And we need to convert that to the array type. Right, so how can we check the implementation? Right, so the first trick in your tool bag is gonna be uh, is detected. This is an experimental function from the type foundations, um, and it's super helpful in doing this. Um, so the way it works is it uses Cinefe to do, detect named entities, and that's gonna be a really important theme as it goes along. So you give it an operator to perform the check on and a type, and it does the work for you. So here we declare an operator, and we're gonna do as array t, and it's gonna be decal type of the traits type as array. Right, so we're, we're looking for that name as array inside of our type traits. And when we use that in a static assert and we give it our example traits, uh, it returns true. Yay, compiles successfully. Um, but if we take something like bad traits, which has a member, which is an integer, just as array, this also compiles because it's just a named entity. It's not a function, it's not the function we need either. Right, so like, oh shit, dang it, now what? Um, so we have to reach into our bag of STL tricks and we're gonna pull out as function. Super helpful and this one will fail, but correctly, right? We're expecting it to fail. We know this isn't a, a function. But if we had a function with the wrong signature, we would again then compile successfully, which is really not what we want. So the thing now we need to do is, is signature. But this doesn't exist in the STL, unfortunately, for us, and nobody's written the implementation. So um, what you need to do is you need to use some, some of the tricks from isDetected and some of the tricks from the STL, and the one we're going to use is isSame. So we're going to have the same idea from isDetected as an operator, where we're going to extract the value of the type that we need, and then we're going to compare it to a signature, right? So Function signatures as types are a little bit weird. Uh, they're not pointers or references, but the syntax is very similar. So you can see here in our array as array, right? we just drop the name of it, the as array, which is what our operator is working on as well. So if we implement is signature and we add it to our static assert, uh, and we work with our good example traits, we can see that it compiles successfully. right? So we have this big giant uh, static assertion, so we can refactor that, and we can actually write our own trait, which is is function signature detected. 
Uh, so we can use our operator to extract the type, and then we can evaluate our is detected, is function, and is signature. And this gives us a custom trait that is specific to our application workflow. Right, so we verified a claim. That was pretty easy, good warm up. Uh, what about creating tokens? So this is an example of a token. It's the same token from earlier. And you can see here that we're trying to serialize encode it, and we're trying to get the header payload and token. So here we have some generic string type from our traits. We don't know what it is because we're auto. Um, and we're calling std operator string type string type, and we're expecting to get back a string type. Right, so how would you go about resolving this, right? So we have his function, or his signature here, and we're just gonna reuse it, right? Should be pretty easy. It doesn't, it fails. Um, so it can't resolve the address of overloaded functions. So one of the downsides of Dackle type is it doesn't work with overloads, ADL, or template functions. You really have to have a very specific instance for it to understand that function signature. Um, it can't return a variant of signatures. It wouldn't understand that, right? So it can only return one specific thing. And, oh shit, now what do we do, right? We, we now gotta come up with a new way of solving our problems. Um, so the trick here is we actually have to resolve that specific function at compile time. And you do this the same way you always would. You actually pass the types and you pass the signature that you need. So in this particular one, we're going to use a std decalval, and we're going to pass our string type. So we're going to pass a compile time reference to decal type, which will actually invoke our std operator function with references of our types. And what decal type is going to do, it's going to return to us the actual string type. So we're going to get the return of the function at compile time without passing any real parameters. We're just going to use references during compile time. So this compiles successfully. Yes, awesome. If we go further along and we go try to split the string, right, so the opposite of creating it, um, we can see here we're calling token, which is a string type. We're expecting the library always to work in the same string type. So we have this string type, and we're trying to call substring on it. It's a very common method. You see it in the STL implementation of a std string. And here, the signature we're looking for is a string type substring. Right, so if we try to use our is function signature detected, worked so well for our own traits implementation, why wouldn't it work here, right? Um, and instead of using something, we're gonna use the stud string, right? Pretty easy. This fails. Dang it, right? Why the hell does it fail? Um, so, like a developer, you break down all your static assertions, which of the three is actually failing, right? And it turns out is function is failing and is signature failing. So why the hell is std string substring not a function, right? You, you would expect that to be a function. Um, you're calling the method, why wouldn't it be? Right, so like what the heck's going on? If we call CP Insights, pull up the web interface and we stick our code in and we actually run it, we get this monstrosity, a uh, memvar pointer nine uh, with a std basic string. All right, that's, that's fine. But we have this weird pointer of an instance, not a type. So when you're working with member functions, you're not actually working with the type of the function. You're actually gonna be getting back pointers when you call decal val on them and decal type. So these aren't the same things, right? This is not the unnamed entity. This is a named entity of std string class which is not what we want. And we have this weird cost that's lingering at the end, like where does that come from? Um, so if we try to do this again, and instead we use decalval, right, we have string type, substring, and we're gonna pass instances of integer type. So one of the types that the JSON traits would expose. Right, so again, we're gonna get a call at compile time to that specific instance of that function. And if we stick it in here and we compile it, compile successfully. Woo! Right, so what if the member function is not implemented? Uh, what if there is actually two different methods that we need to support? 
So we have here two different JSON libraries. We have one, a best API JSON library, and it uses the subscription operator to access uh, key value pairs inside of its object type. And on this side, we have performance uh, JSON library, and it's using the at method. So both these methods are trying to do the same thing. They're trying to access a specific key and return you a generic value, but they have two different API signatures. Right, so if we go back to our previous example, where we're using is substring, uh, it compiled, right? But if this method wasn't implemented, right, and we have a, a different string type, this is just an example here where we have a basic string that doesn't have any methods. Um, if we actually try, this fails at compile time, and this is not what we want, right? We need some way of being able to detect multiple variants of methods. Right, so because decalval generates an instance at compile time, and because decal type invokes that specific instance, we're not actually working with substitution, right? So everything's actually being evaluated and compiled. So we're not in a context where you can actually use Cinefe, right? So the downside to decalval is you lose that substitution context. So how do we get it back, right? This is the whole thing that we need to do. We need to add it back. Um, we're gonna create our own special wrapper to invoke these and add back the substitution. Right, so this is our main test, right? So this time, instead of being the substring, it's gonna be the subscription operator, right? And we're doing a decal of our type, operator subscription, and we're passing our integer argument. Right, and this little helper here is just a shorthand. So in decal type, you can either cast a void and specify an optional return type uh, if it's not present. And this is a really sneaky trick. Uh, we're going to trick the compiler into preferring one of our options. Uh, so zero, if you just put zero, is actually an integer, not a long. That's how the compiler interprets it. So by making our good test, the main test that we want to actually succeed, an int, the compiler will prefer that substitution overload. Uh, and for long, that's the wrong one, so it's gonna fail to false. So when our Cinefe true decal val decal type, weird mess of words that you probably can't even remember after this, um, doesn't work and it returns a std type false, the other one will actually get picked. So we're adding back our substitution by doing this workaround. And then here we have our main test again, which is test operator, and we pass our object type and our string type, as well as our sneaky little zero over there. So just a quick review. Uh, to check static functions, we can use is detected is function and is same. That's what we put under the hood of our is signature. Uh, you can resolve overloaded functions with the help of decalval. And to overcome Decaville's lack of substitution, you can add template helpers to return true type, false type. So the answer to uh, Decaville is adding more indirection, which is almost always gonna be the answer when you work with Cinefe. That's it, thank you very much. Any questions? Um, wouldn't you think like C20 concepts would solve like 99% of the problems described above? You would assume so, uh, but concepts actually require you to implement traits, especially when you want to get really fancy and complicated. Now, concepts have only been out for the last year, so I haven't had the chance to use it on a large code base with complicated problems like this one. But if you're going to implement the concept, you still need to have substitution as a failure if you want to support multiple different API methods. So if your algorithm can work with a set of methods, you'll still end up having to write traits to do the things that you need. Um, so you could implement the trait that would be your concept, and you can use this trait in your concept requires statement, but it wouldn't exactly cover it for you.
Awesome. Well, thank you very much, everybody.